people don't sit on the ground enough in our culture. We're always chair bound. We're, you know, driving, commuting, sitting in chairs at our offices. I read you guys book cover to cover and I loved every second of it. I felt like I could not, I couldn't not read it because it was just so ripe with insight, but also value, but also just like so practical. And for a lot of people listening, their mission is to not just be healthy, but to experience that longevity health span. And so one of the things that really stood out to me, and here's a confession, by the way, a lot of the things that you were talking about, I was already doing on accident, right? And I'm just like, wow, that's so awesome. I'm, I'm more awesome now that I got the certified stamp from you two. <laughs> One of the things you talk about in the book is that we need to spend more time sitting on the floor. Talk about that. Why does that matter? I mean, we, start, we started the book. That's chapter one. We started that for a reason. Um, in part because we love the test that's associated with it and the test that's associated with that chapter is you just get up and down off the floor without putting your hands Criss -cross in crisscross applesauce crisscross applesauce um and and the the backstory on that test is there was a, a study done some years ago that people who could get up and down off the floor without putting their hands down lived longer um and 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 lived better and lived better which i think is what we're all really looking for and so so um what we realized is that people don't sit on the ground enough in our culture we're always chair bound we're you know driving commuting sitting in chairs at our offices um, our whole environment is set up to be sitting in chairs all the time um, and so we've literally lost the ability to both get up and down off the ground and sit comfortably on the floor. I mean, it's really interesting when we suggest to people like, oh, okay, well, you need to start this test by being crisscross applesauce. And a lot of people go, crisscross applesauce? What? I can't sit like that. Mm. Um, and so it's, it's just an ability that we've really lost that's so fundamental as humans. Yeah. And, you know, what we've recommended to people is that they just had more sitting on the floor while they're watching Netflix which is something that we know everybody's doing at least three hours of a day. Um, and so we just think it's so fundamental as a human to be able to get up and down off the ground. Um, and, and also it makes us more durable. And I think the word we like, and we're fans of all things longevity, and obviously this book is connected to that, but I think the word we prefer is durability mm -hmm. because really Kelly and I don't care if we live to be 100, we want to, live as long as we live but feel good for as long as possible and then just like fall off a cliff and die that's our goal <laughs> like we just kind of want to be like this and yeah. then fall off the cliff and die and feel as good as we can and live independently and be able to move with our body and hopefully keep our mental acuity that's really our goal and to us that's more durability because if that means we live to be 85 or 90 like great we would rather feel good and then just fall off the cliff um so i think that sitting on the ground thing is so fundamental to this book and 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 seems so straightforward but really is strangely revolutionary since we never do it when i saw the going off the cliff i pictured you both your faces on some lemming bodies and going off that cliff happily we like this <laughs> go ahead put your hand on. there we go <laughs> you'll be driving listen this is so simple but you know and i actually want to share this i noted this you just mentioned the study this was published in the european journal of preventive cardiology and it revealed that this simple act, this simple test was correlated with how long people lived. And you also share, because if it's a concern of being able to sit cross leg on the floor, you share a variety of mobilization exercises throughout the book and in particular in this chapter and habits that we can use to improve performance on this particular test. And just to share with you guys, I had my 11 year old son do it, which you would see him and think, oh, this kid isn't flexible. He did it easily, like easily. easily. Yeah. For me, it wasn't super easy, I could do it, but it wasn't just like as You felt a little creaking graceful. as you were standing up. <laughs> I mean, just to see how it was like he's, you know, like it was like he was flying just the way he did it so easily. But you mentioned, you talk about these mobilizations, 90-90 sitting, cross leg sitting in and of itself, leg up, one leg up sitting, hip opener exercises. Can you talk about some of these things? The first order of business for anything is to do the thing you want to get better at not a correlate, not a test for it. Yeah. So this first opening chapter is a little sneaky because what we do is we get people in with a, something that they can wrap their heads around, right? Which is, I should be able to do this. I watch kids do it, sitting on the ground. And quickly you're confronted with 
wow, I really struggled with that or that was harder than I thought. Mm. And it's a nice test because it illuminates this idea that, hey, we're not interested in gymnast level mobility. We're interested in the this, this central idea of can you move and own your way through your world? What is it you want to do? And a lot of times, because the body is so durable and because our world is shaped a certain specific way, we're not really confronted with limitations until you go to yoga and you're like, wow, I can't do that. Or I want to learn a new skill and that was really challenging. I can't put my arms over my head and we're going climbing today. So one of the things that we try to do with this book is create this language of vital signs because you're not going to die tomorrow if you can't get up off the ground. That's not what it is. But it helps you begin to establish some benchmarks around how you move and some of your other behaviors. And what we the follow up to that is the first order of business to get better at this is to sit on the ground. Right. And we're realizing that instead of applying some fancy tool or here's our 10 day optimized sit on the ground program in front of the TV, let's see if we can work this into your life where we can begin to work on your hip range motion in the background. The mobilizations in there are something we call position transfer exercises. They're just sneaky ways to give you a window of opportunity so that you can move more freely. And in this situation, the expression of mid-range hip range of motion inflection is getting up and down off the ground so we've got some tools in there to help you restore those positions but the first thing is knowing that hey that was a little bit trickier than I thought maybe I should spend some more time doing it or B I crush that don't need to worry about it because I sit on the ground all the time and you know I'm a yogi and my hip range motion is good yeah. well and also some of those positions you mentioned like 90 90 sitting and long sit you know for most people who don't spend a lot of time sitting on the floor they will naturally need to change positions yep. for most people yep. sitting cross-legged for an hour is like not possible like you know most of us who have spent a lot of time sitting it's just not possible or comfortable to sit that long so so the cool thing is your body will actually kind of give you these cues to move and right. you're like all right well i'm no longer co comfortable sitting cross-legged so i'm going to move to 90 90 or i'm going to move to long sit and if you just watch someone sort of practice sitting on the ground it's actually subconscious you naturally just move from position to position and so without even thinking about it you're getting all this work on your hip range of motion and it's it's most of it is just subconscious and the only real conscious thing you've done is decide to sit on the floor versus sit on the couch it's so brilliant you know one of the things that i was accidentally doing until i got you guys certified stamp of approval is if i'm sitting on the floor i would naturally go into that 90 90 position after a while i would naturally kick one foot up yeah. and hold my knee and i'm just like these are pictures of me they've been spying <laughs> like, this I'm is incredible this. <laughs> but i didn't think about it as being like a transfer kind of exercise or just lining up my mind and body to do this activity, which for whatever reason, I contacted you actually a couple years ago when I got injured and I just started sitting on the floor more. I don't, maybe it was because of the excessive comfiness of the couch that I was laying on as oh, I was like so couch bound, right? you yeah. know, just going through that kind of, you know, that pain sequence. But once I kind of got up and moving around again, I wanted to spend more time on the floor. Yeah. There's a there's a great writer named Philip Beach who wrote a great book called Muscles and Meridians. And he in there describes sort of it's a, a book about embryology of the human being, but functional embryology. I know that's pretty nerdy. But what in, is functional embryology? In there, understanding <laughs> sort of what our development says about us. But one of the things he points out is that's one of the ways the body can tune itself. We're touching positions and shapes and loading connective tissue. And it's all passive and, and because it's done, it's run as a sort of a exercise program in the background of just dealing. And, and traditionally, Jill will tell you, I just recently had this crazy experience where I, if I couldn't do that, I don't know what I would have done. But one of the things that we see is that the environment in which we currently reside is really modernized in the last 150 years. Mm -hmm. But before that, we used to just, do a lot more with our bodies. And I'm not trying to romanticize our Paleolithic selves and hunting and gathering, that's what I'm saying. But it does hint at, we have changed our world in such a way that sometimes our tissues don't get exposed. And there's really complex things that happen. So if you sit on the ground that 90-90, you're working some of the connective tissue that connects your femur, your leg, to your pelvis. That changes how your pelvic floor works. That changes some of the loads to you're putting some great flexion load into your lumbar. You're taking that hip into full flexion or knee to chest. So you're starting to use the full language of the body 
And you don't have to be an expert in it. Just sit in front of the TV for a while. When you get a little fidgety, know that in the background, amazing processes are happening. Let's talk specifically about chair sitting as we're sitting in chairs, hanging out with each other, which you said this term that I just is just burned into my mind now, marathon sitting, right? So we spend an insane amount of time in our culture just sitting in a chair. Sure. What's happening in our bodies, like our biomechanics, when we spend a lot of time sitting in a chair? Well, I'll just start by saying Kelly can talk about the specifics, but I'll start by saying just to sort of define marathon sitting. You know, I think what we've learned with the research is that if you sit for short periods of time and get up and continue moving fine. around and sit back down, that's actually completely fine. Like we, we've we never set out to demonize sitting and sitting's awesome and we do plenty of it. But what you do see is people are sitting in a chair and often doing that for five, six, eight longer you know even longer sometimes without actually moving at all um and you know kelly's obsessed with the lymphatic system which is basically the sewage Isn't system every of the body. middle-aged man and and so one of the things that happens when we sit is that you know the way that you clear your lymphatic system you clear the waste out of your body is through movement so specifically you know, muscle control one of the things we like to talk about is like have you ever been on a flight and then you get to wherever you're going and you have cankles have you ever gotten cankles? I can't say that I have, but I've seen them. I've seen okay. them on the streets. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I've, yeah. I've read about you, you've it. You've seen I've cankles. You've <laughs> seen cankles. Um, but, you know, that that's just a function of sitting in, in an airplane and not moving enough for long periods of time. Like sitting on a five or six hour flight is like the perfect example of marathon sitting. Yeah. And one of the downstream negative consequences is that you're not moving and you're not flushing your system. You're not getting, you know, you're not getting the garbage out of your body. And, um, and you know, it's, it's just, and then the other thing I'll say, and Kelly can talk about the technical terms about this, but I mean, then you're sitting all the time with all of your joints at 90 degree angles. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're not meant to be at 90 degree angles with our joints all the time. And so I think a lot of people don't make the connection between low back pain and general stiffness and other issues they have um, with just bouts of marathon sitting. And what you start to play around with is, there's a whole new field called sedentary biology, where we're starting to understand a little bit about what happens to our physiology, our normal processing of our bodies when we don't move. So we can define, not sitting versus standing, but we can define sedentary behavior in a very scientific and very specific way. If you ever remember the old uh, Stairmaster machines from like the 90s, I love or those two, early 2000s, for those of you out there, or from the nice, there was a metric on there that you could use, which was METS. Do you remember METS? And you'd be like, I don't know how many METS is, but I'm killing the MET game right now, right? <laughs> you just jack it up, <laughs> all the METS. That's a metabolic equivalent. That's how much energy it takes kind of for a human being to run. And so what we they have defined at Harvard as sedentary behavior is falling below one and a half metabolic equivalents. And it turns out sitting immediately really starts to truncate how much energy we're using. So we fall below that one and a half metabolic equivalents, and then our physiology starts to get weird. We start not being able to burn sugar, and we start to do things strangely, and things are, are not moving and working as well as they can. So really, it's not ever, ever about sitting versus standing. It's about, not hey, moving. how do I limit this below one and a half metabolic equivalents? So again, man, if you're exhausted, sit down, it feels so good to take it off. But maybe you could get more movement in. And what we the research has, has defined is let's try to limit and aggregate that total amount of time below one and a half metabolic equivalents to six hours. So you have sort of six hours of, of coins you can put into whatever machine you want. This is my commute. This is my dinner time. This is hanging out. And maybe we can try to limit that because it really makes it more difficult for us to do the things we want to do. Hey, I want to have a... I want to change my body composition. Well, that's going to make that more difficult. I want to be more awesome at sprinting. Well, that's going to make that more difficult. I want to have healthier tissues. You know, I want to have more clarity in my brain. It makes that more difficult. So again, that allows us to expand. And when we empower people with that idea, say, hey, wow, I really been sitting a long time. Let me see if I can limit that in whatever way I want. So can we talk about this interaction with the chair itself mm. pressing up against or us, our group, our our weight pressing up against the chair and the intermingling going on with our hamstrings versus when we're being a little bit more, dare I say, natural sitting on the floor. I, I'm just going to cue you up to say panini. Panini. And then you take it away. <laughs> we'll do a couple of experiments here. One is 
your butt and hamstrings are actually non weight bearing surfaces. If you actually sit on the ground, you're sitting on your ischial tuberosities. The bottom of your pelvis is kind of bony and set up for it, right? And when we're sitting in the chair, we're not actually sitting on the bony structures of our pelvis, we're sitting on all the soft tissue structures. So if you imagine high pressure, I'm like 106 kilos, I weigh, you know, my temperature is a certain amount. That's how you make panini, high pressure, high temperature. I mean, you get grilled cheese. So if you're worried about your hamstring range of motion, maybe you shouldn't make grilled cheese sandwiches out of your hamstrings. We could also do another experiment. I have said this in a long, long time, but bear with me. Think of the most beautiful person you could think of. Got it in your head? Got it. Like for me, like like Chris Pine and and Chris <laughs> Hemsworth have a baby and that baby boy grows up to marry Brad Pitt and they have a baby, right? You can see like that's a beautiful what about person. Kate? Kate Kate's in there too. And if you think of that person's butt, what does it look like? Wow. It's gorgeous, right? <laughs> Now think about your palm of your hand yeah. and your hand is a weight bearing surface and it's the connective tissues gnarly. And now think if that butt of that person looked like the palm of your hand, mm. it is not. So what you're seeing is we have certain areas of the body that are really good at weight bearing, like your feet, your hands, these sit bones. And then we have areas that aren't, it's such a problem when people sit for a long time, like the Aralon chair, right? That really expensive chair by Herman Miller. They invented that chair working with people who were in wheelchairs who had diabetic ulcers. So what was happening was that people would get these pressure ulcers when they had to sit in a wheelchair for a long period of time. So they invented this fabric that allowed to unload the connective tissue. Well, that's a small scale model of us all the time sitting on tissues. They're not getting good blood flow. We're not pumping the garbage out. Do you need to be worried about it? I don't I'm making this doom and gloom, but that's just some a snapshot of sort of hey long long periods of time that's probably not great then you add in we're not really having access to all the mechanisms that stabilize our spines so we can't really connect your pelvis to your hips very well we can't use your glutes we can't use the rotators we can't stabilize so you end up using a whole bunch of other things yeah. to keep yourself upright and that's fine until you go stand up and then when you realize you, you're like, oh, my, get out of that chair and you're a little creaky, that's your body not really just immediately giving you access to your full range of motion. There's a quote from your book. It says, once you start sitting on the floor and standing more, you'll find that it not only feels natural, but that you'll crave it. And when I read that, I was like, that is my exact experience. My body tells me I'm craving. I was just sitting with my wife last night and you've got like a sectional couch that latches together. She's got her area. The, <laughs> my, my youngest son calls it the queendom spot. Yes, yes. Right? <laughs> and so I have to ask permission to come sit by her over here because it's just a thing. And so I'm sitting there and she's coming to kind of get in the nook on my, on my left side. And she's laying there for a bit. And the reason she doesn't like to get comfortable in that because she knows I'm going to get up. And so after a certain amount of time, I just felt my body just like, go sit on the floor. What do you do? Go sit on the floor. And also, one of the things that starts to happen, which because I was talking to you guys today, this is the first time I'm saying the words out loud. While we were sitting there, you know, watching whatever show it was, maybe like five, 10 minutes into it, my leg starts doing this. Like my legs just starts bouncing up and down. And I don't know that I'm doing it, but all of a sudden she grabs my leg and like silences my leg. And I felt like, get your hands off you me. Can't you can't know? continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, I can't get moved. <laughs> She's like, stop. I'm like, babe, I'm just expressing myself. I said something, <laughs> you know, but I knew what it was. Just like I wanted to to move. I wanted to change positions, but she was comfortable and, you know, the whole thing. And so literally, once you start getting these movement inputs, your body starts to crave them. It'll tell you. But the, there's something really seductive about sitting in a chair where a lot of stuff starts turning off. And, Perfect. That's you know, what we should be doing. Let's sit down to turn stuff off. That's great. Exactly Th right. That's the right time and application. I've been on my feet all day. It's time to change gears. I need to relax. What's that look like as a as a kind of conscious strategy? Well, and I think you know you sh like one of the ways I know that I've shifted over into that crave way is that you know way back in the day I used to be able to sit on a flight and 
I, I mean, I, I didn't find it to be comfortable, but I, I wasn't dying. And now I'm dying on a flight. Is that because like, you have OCS? I might have OCS. But I mean, I just, I, but while I'm sitting there, it's not about, it's not that I'm physically uncomfortable sitting. It's that I literally want to jump out of the chair and move yeah. around. Yeah. Um, and, and I struggle with that. And in a way, I think that's a positive thing because You've to become me, an 11 year old boy. That, to me, that tells me <laughs> that I've shifted over to, to that exact thing we talked about in the book, which is really craving, wanting to keep moving, moving moving my body into different yeah. positions. And, and ultimately that's the goal. And I think people listening to this actually can get to that place. I mean, I think maybe people will think, well, look at those are those fitness guys. And of course they crave movement or something, you know, but, but I mean, I think it's really possible for people to practice some of these things, practice sitting on the ground, practice standing a little more at the office, standing a little more throughout the day. And then I really do think your body starts to really crave that feeling. And then that's when, you know, you've won. So we can, also throw another wrench in that and say <clears throat> everything we do has a cost on the body and that's not negative if i exercise exercise actually makes me weaker right do a bunch of reps or i go for a run or do something and i get i i get tired i get fatigued my body adapts to that stress and i become a more effective person right the idea is adaptation to the stress so one of the things that we do in our sort of professional life, we're working with high level performers, is that we look at their session or the training session or the competition session, and we can sort of assign a competition cost or a session cost to that. And you can look at that if you look at resting heart rate the next day. People are like, okay, if you have a high resting heart rate, we can tell that you're under recovered from that big effort, right? You're living under a whole lot of stress. You did, your sleep was a little bit fragmented. We can see the cost of that, 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 stress well we can also do that with movement so if i have you i'm training you as an athlete and i have you do a bunch of wor heavy leg work but then you suck in your sport training the next day that's a session cost so how do i reduce the session cost well if you do a lot of sitting the session cost will be that you're going to not be as effective at extending your hip or getting into a lunge shape or doing a Bulgarian split squat or realizing that your, your quads are a little stiff and you go into a little lunge or you go to yoga and you're warrior one and you're like, whoa, this is really difficult. And so what we can start to see is that, hey, this sitting, well, doesn't cause anyone to die right away, may impact my ability to continue to move as effectively in my environment. And that's where we can start to be a little bit more nuanced, especially when you have a vital sign, especially when you have a way of quick checking in with yourself around, oh, how am I doing? I haven't, I haven't had to do a lot of travel. We, we flew on an airplane, we had to drive around LA. Like I guarantee you tonight, if I do my session cost test on the couch stretch, one of you know this this hip extension chapter i'm going to suck at it and then what i say to myself is oh I need to spend some time here yeah so this is so good so good you know you really outline again there's particular mobilization exercises that you give people but you said it to start things off the most important thing if we want to improve our ability to sit on the ground is sitting on the ground that's right right and with that said one of the most obvious but not obvious things for us to do is to incorporate some rotational factors into this, right? So going from sitting in the chair to standing, to sitting on the ground, to kneeling, adding in and creating an environment, and this is another chapter in the book, another vital sign, you talk about creating a movement-rich environment. Let's talk about that. So TM, by the way. <laughs> we have an ongoing debate about yeah. who created that phrase, but um, she just you guys have created so she, much stuff. She claimed that one at one point. <laughs> let's, just, let's just get it out um, here. Wide, you know, mobility wide. Like wide. you, you've yes. put so much into public consciousness, right? And you know, you see these things replicated today. It's cool. And I know it's like you got these babies out in the world. It's just like I didn't know I, yeah. I had these babies out here. You're kind of like, who's got a lot of babies they don't know about? Maybe Chuck Berry or something. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> anyways, <laughs> anyways, Chuck Berry. back to anyway, back <laughs> movement, to movement rich, rich environment. environment. I mean, I think one of the things that we love about that phrase, and and generally, is that, you know. And let me, let me tee this up a little bit. Contrary to what people may think because we're in the health and fitness b business, you know, we are busy working parents who are often really time crunched. Um, and maybe at the most we have an hour a day to get in our workout. And then anything else we do for our health has to be sprinkled in to what we're already doing, whether that's hanging out with our kids, working, 
you know, sitting in front of the TV, watching TV at night. I mean, we really have had to figure out ourselves in our own life, how we can add all of these things into our life. Because and trust me, I'm trying to offload my schedule so that I can journal and meditate and do gratitude <laughs> practice and sauna and ice and food prep in the morning for myself. For but it's not working very well. You know, and, and one of the things I see is, you know, we we have a lot of friends who are busy working parents and they don't have time to do those things in the morning. They've got to get up and get their kids fed and breakfast and lunch. Something's and gotta give. Out the door and something's gotta something's, to, gotta, something's give. gotta give. And we'll give. Right. And so um so we approach this with this idea that maybe everybody has an hour a day and most people, at least in our case, we want to use that hour a day to exercise. Or do what we want to uh, do. Or do what we want to do. Mountain bike or whatever. Skateboard, whatever. Um and and so people do not have a lot of discretionary time to add in all these behaviors that they may know in this case in our book i'm sure a lot of people know four or five of the chapters they're supposed to be doing something but they don't really know how to do it they don't know how to measure it there's no objective measure um, they can't figure out how to fit it into their lives one of the things i like about creating a movement rich environment is this idea that we have that's worked so effectively in our own life is that it's all about constraining your own environment or the other phrase we use is peppering your environment so if you look at our living room, for example, it's like a mobility tool paradise. And don't get me wrong, it doesn't look junky. Like you it can have a junky. mid-century modern cool. cool house. We can still have guests over and you know, we don't look like weird hippies. Um, but you know, easy access are simple ways to help us sit on the floor comfortably access to mobility tools, percussion tools, you know, heavy objects we can put on our quads while we're watching TV. We just make it easy for ourselves because often as time crunch people, we don't have, we don't even have the mental capacity to make another decision. It just has to be mm. presented to us. Yeah. It has to be there in our environment. Another example is that our office has all of the places to work, our standing desks. Now that all those desks also have a stool associated with them. So if you're tired or sick or just having a tough day and you want to sit for the whole day, you can. So we've set up our office. So the default is to be standing and we give people a lot of movement option. The other thing we do is keep a lot of little toys and balance toys and slant boards around, not just around our office, but around our house. Um, and, and we just are trying to make it super easy to make the right decision. I mean, what Kelly likes to say is he's like, look, if I have cookies in the house, I'm going to eat cookies. Um, if my oh. only option in my environment is chairs and couches and I'm, I'm set up to work that way and yeah. I'm set up to enjoy TV that way and you know everything I do is chair based, then that's what I'm going to do. Um, but if we can just do these little simple things to create an environment where we can move more in little micro ways, it just adds up over time. And, and it's also realistic for normal people who are busy and time crunched. And we saw this crazy thing happen in the pandemic, which we can talk about more, where fitness is this trillion dollar industry now, and we are getting really good and very sophisticated in certain verticals. And uh, if we really look at how the rest of our family, our neighbors are doing, it's not great. Increased depression, substance abuse, low back pain, surgeries. I mean, just choose something that you care about. ACL rates in kids whew, skyrocket. I mean, just there's something there. So for us, what we learned is, wow, that's that's a bummer. And our experiment for the last decade in fitness hasn't been great, right? Well, we've made ourselves way more optimized. We haven't brought everyone along with us, which is mm -hmm. which is a thing that we need to do a better job of is, is bring everyone along. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you can see in the pandemic with people working at home on their laptops was that their home environment was for living. And it wasn't built for being on Zoom all day long. And so you sat on your couch, you sat in your dining room, and suddenly we had sort of a really insidious environment person mismatch. People didn't have a monitor, they didn't have the right seating, they didn't have movement choice. So they ended up kind of defaulting to what their environment said. And that should make sense to us. But as an allegory for sort of understanding the influence of this sort of insidious choice, on how much you move in your environment and how you interact with your environment, we want to try to put more, more agency back and awareness. And if you don't know, well, now you know. And what we can see is this movement rich environment means it's up to you and it doesn't have to be expensive, but just giving yourself choice 
so that you don't have to make a heroic decision at the end of the day when you are cooked. Because when I'm smoked, I'm smoked. That's it. I'm done. I don't. I can't. I'm not gonna get on the ground and you know do some. You're not gonna like get in the car at 8 p.m. and go to an eight hour like a one hour balance class. It's not gonna happen. Right, but you know you need to practice your balance. So how do you fit that in? It seems so obvious again, you know. And so again, accidentally, I have this. I, you know, my side of the couch, you know, the, the kingdom spot, maybe. My son doesn't call it that. I don't get a fancy name for where I do. Throne, really throne is fun. But there's a <laughs> there's a, a, a roller there. There's two, actually. Uh, there's a big one. There's a little one. Yes. There's a bunch of uh, different, what are these called? Therapy balls, small ones. This is right there. They're right there sitting by the couch, right? I got them actually there in a birthday bag. Somebody gave me a birthday present, and I kept the little bag, and I got balls in there. And I added in a belt for me to do the hamstring stretch that you have in the book. Perfect. It's in that bag right there. I've got the, you know, a ther their gun. Like it's all there, it's right there. And also sitting right on the arm of the couch, I've got like grip strengtheners and all this kind of stuff, you know, because grip strength correlated with longevity. I was like, hey, this let me put that around. So I'll just pick it up and, and play with it. We had uh, a bunch of hypervolts, which is percussion from hyper ice, at our gym. And we just put them on the counter because sometimes you're like, I don't know when I'm going to fit this in or how do I work this in my class? And what we watched was people grabbing that thing when they saw it, kind of being aware and then put it on their bodies. Yep. And one of the things that we've taken from that watching is that if you just make it available. So we have a couple of those next to the couch. They're, they're cool. They're hidden out of the way. But our children are like, weren't. they're watching TV, chilling at the end of the evening. And all of a sudden they're getting some input in now is some kind of percussion device going to solve all your movement related problems no but nor should you be thinking that it is but if you can make yourself feel better quickly or touch a sore spot or bling some blood flow or just massage your hands if you do that on the regular you're going to be shocked at how much better you start feeling so we see it as an important tool as you said i get this trigger I'm like, oh, there it is. I didn't have to think about it. And then I can just be doing something. Some of our favorite work has come about where I've solved problems like complex hamstring tendinopathies because I'm sitting watching TV on my coffee table, rolling out my hamstrings and butt with a roller. And I'm like, oh, this is a good idea. I should try it, you know. So just keep in mind that we're trying to make it easier because what we see is that that consistency and barrier to entry, the long haul, that wins. And the other thing is it's, you know, we obviously have specific mobilizations and tactics, but I think what people will realize when they start to have their, you know, by the couch toolkit or, you know, their toolkit at their office or wherever they have it is that, you know, at first you need a little bit of instruction on sort of like how to begin and what to do. But I think people then also start to, once you've done it a little bit, you start to instinctively know you're like, oh, this part of my body's bugging me a little bit. Mm, when I was doing something today, my shoulder bothered Session me, cost. so I should spend time there. And you actually just start to have a, a bit of awareness about what's going on in your body. And then you just, again, you crave it. You naturally want to, you know, put a ball or roller or do a percussion device and and it's just second nature. Again, it's not a heroic decision you have to make at the end of a long, busy day. So check this out. Everyone here has had stiff calves, tight calves. Did a bunch of walk in your calves. If you just instinctively do that, bend over, touch your toes, stretch your calf, put your leg up on a, you know, on a curb. Everyone can relate to, hey, I need to move this thing or stretch this thing. I think everyone, like, ever had sore quads? What'd you do? You stretched and you got a massage and... What do you do for your sore abs? Nothing. You have never ever treated your abs and your trunk the way you treated your glutes or pigeon pose, your triceps. And one of the things we see is that a lot of people struggle with low back dysfunction or back pain or just my back doesn't feel good. And one of the things that we, perfect time is at work, take off, you know, pull up your dress, lay on. No, you're never going to do that at work. But at home, you can be chilled out telling your body this is you're safe here and you can start to roll with your feet up on the couch kind of laying on your back 90 90 you know what i mean just that recovery position Put, sneak that ball into your low back sneak that ball into your trunk get on your stomach on the roller and suddenly if you have a set of tools and we do this in our first aid kit in there 
then you can start applying that up and down your body. And your trunk isn't some miracle, weird tissue system that doesn't obey the laws of every other tissue system in your body. But think about the number of crunches you've done and your abs are kind of sore and you're stoked because you know you're gonna have a six pack tomorrow, right? <laughs> and you do nothing for it. You just hope it gets stiffer and gnarlier. So. Again, what's great is if you're already sitting on the ground, it's easier to lay down or it's easier to, you know. So how can we be thinking in those terms around these are the benchmarks around inputs so that I can feel better and be a better member of my community? And I know how to put out a fire when it comes because that is the definition of durable, being able to yeah. take the hit, not with, not avoid the hit. Absolutely, absolutely. You also dedicate a vital sign to hip extension, which... We'll save that. I want to make sure everybody picks up a copy because it was kind of like one of those things where if you got if you're pulling my leg on what is most important, which you you set it up saying there's nothing that's more important than anything else when it comes to mobility, but hip extension is super important. But I, I want people to read that chapter. But in it, you have a sidebar about the booty, all right? And I think it's titled like the rear view, right? And you mentioned something along the lines of our butts are sleepy. All right, our, our butt cheeks are are sleeping on the job <laughs> and you kind of give a, a, a command or a cue for us to check in with our butt through the day and fire those. We can do it right now. Right, I, right, I just it wanna, can I just interject and say that if like, your butt. If, Kelly, if Kelly's name had a subtitle, it would be Kelly Starrett, hip extension. Mm. Cause he's really excited. About I may it or may days. not also own already on Instagram, knees behind butt guy. <laughs> <laughs> trying to get you into hip extension look what you're hinting at is a really interesting phenomenon where you know if you lose connection or we're not using it we can see decrease in function around muscles and and movements more importantly and this hip extension chapter one of the things that happens when we lose the ability to get into a lunge shape so walking is a little mini lunge shape a big lunge, formal lunge is a big extended version of that. If you've ever like seen running someone, is like a mid yeah, lunge. Yeah, yeah. And if you've ever seen someone sprint, that is lunging, lunge form, that hip extension. And one of the things we see is if you cannot get into that position for whatever reason, we don't know if it's your hips are stiff or your quad stiff, you don't never there. But if you can't get in that position, oftentimes what we see is you can't also squeeze your butt as effectively and in fact in that position particularly your glutes become very difficult to find we call it positional inhibition which means i'm in this position and it's my inability to be strong in this position that has shut my butt off or my ability to recruit that glute squeeze and what we know is that when we start reconnecting the dots for people things like low back pain starts to get better Right, we got a big engine starting to help me manage that a little bit. When we start to see people working on their hip extension, guess what? Your knees have to work when your legs behind your body. And because we spend so much time not in that position, we see that it's a ends up being a blind spot for a lot of people. We have a, a couple new products on the market that were tools for us. And one of them is a Bulgarian split squat pad. So if you've ever done a Bulgarian split squat, it's where you basically get into a lunge shape and then you go up and down. And it is gnarly. No one likes but to do it. But your rear foot is elevated. Rear foot is elevated. A rear foot elevated split squat. But it is such a good movement. And again, no one likes to do them. Why? Because that's a position we suck. Meanwhile, we also made this thing for better booty thrusts or hip thrusts. You lay down on the bar. You can just do this beautiful hip thrust. It's, I'm so proud of this thing. It sells 10 to 1. Why? Because everyone loves the booty thrust because you can feel your booty. Guess who loves to get into the split lunge position? Zero people. Well, it's like people I, I made like, here's some really toxic, gnarly vegetables that are really good for you. Eat those. Like no one wants those. Like give me the cookies. I want the booty. I want the well, hip flexion. Back to the movement rich environment and standing a little bit though. I mean, you know, we do actually talk about just like being conscious of squeezing your butt throughout the day. Yeah. Um, and you can do that while you're standing. So, you know, it's, it's it, again, it's actually for me become something that's subconscious, but I'm always playing with my foot position, squeezing my butt throughout the day when I'm standing. And then, you know, obviously when I get tired, I will take a seat, but you know, it's just being conscious of making sure to keep those things active and going and, you know, aware that the 90 degree angle is not great. Let me ask you this, when you exercise, do you do it first thing in the morning or do you work in and around all the other day job you have? It's in the morning, not first thing, but it's definitely in the early part of the day. One of the things that we 
see if you have a movement, if you change your environment to be more conducive to moving more, is that you're more able to be warmed up for your workout. So if you work out at lunch and you've been sitting all day, it's gonna take you a little while to get air, all the lights on in the house, get the diesel running and warmed up. But if you've been moving more, squeezing your butt, working on your balance, changing position, fidgeting, you're gonna be able to slip right into that quick 30 minute Peloton, that, that, that hour long CrossFit class, whatever it is you wanna do, you'll find that you can be better prepared more quickly. And then on the other side of that, we see that you can continue to decongest and you don't have to do as long a warm down because you're constantly moving. Versus if you wanna feel the recipe for getting old, do some gnarly, gnarly workout, then sit in a chair for an hour. And let me tell you how you feel when you wake up. Mm. When you stand up from that, you're gonna feel terrible. So you share in the book some really sobering news that... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, buddy. No, this is, listen, this is important. I don't know if anybody else is gonna ask you about this. Number one, you share that having a weak booty is associated with a variety of injuries. I'm sorry. With that said, you also briefly, I think people could even miss it, mention booty implants. All right. Now, I'm curious from your professional opinion, I want to talk about butt implants. <laughs> Being that this system is so intelligent and in informing, you know, all of this connective tissue and all of this, you know, this, this musculature. When we throw in some booty implants, are there any potential ramifications with kind of throwing off this intelligence of the system? First of all, the internet thinks that I have calf implants because my calves are so amazing. These are not implants. <laughs> These calves are mooing. Hashtag right natty calves. I've <laughs> <laughs> oh been dying to drop that. <laughs> Um, you know, what I think is interesting is that how amazing that we intuitively know a strong, righteous butt is so good, but we don't know how to grow it or, or work on it, so we'll just augment it. There's a whole bunch of funny things that happen. Your body is an incredible system of systems, and we've run this experiment in other parts of the body that when you change your leverages, you change your fascia and connective tissue, there are always unintended consequences. We can basically make a flat statement is that you cannot cheat your physiology. There's gonna be inputs and outputs. There are gonna be unintended consequences. If you go only drink vodka for the next two days, I guarantee you there's gonna be a consequence for that, right? And if you do, if you think you can cheat or shortcut, you cannot. There, You may not have to pay a big gnarly price, but it will impact your performance a little bit. So, you know, Surgery is gnarly. Booty implants tell me that you're not willing to really work for the booty. You haven't earned the booty, you know, because and speaking as a man, a white man with a big booty, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm proud of my booty. Yeah, I mean, as someone who's had to have quite a few surgeries in my life, I'm always like, man, wouldn't you just rather deadlift or something? Like, it's it's really hard for me to understand. Especially when um, and you can just squeeze of, your butt. Speaking of, you know, being a white man with a big booty, before we got started, we were talking about... <laughs> your highlight reel of times you've blown your pants out, you know, because of the sheer girth of your quads and your butt. It's real. Yeah, you're out here just, and sometimes the, the pants blow out has happened when you've been commando, apparently as well. Early so. on, oh, yeah. I wasn't, oh, yeah. I wasn't. He learned his lesson though. It was a new phenomenon. Look, shout out to all of the people who brought in elastic, materials I, yeah i, think I mean the big problem different was, sex made that possible and cool for men to have stuff that stretches yeah i mean they they made they started making women's clothing stretchy long before men's right mm -hmm. there was this period where your jeans were still like actually jeans and actual board shorts had no stretchiness whatsoever that was really the dark time for him <laughs> dark time of butt that blowout mid, when i work out east. i still pull my ages. my shorts up high uh -huh. because it used to be that the stiff shorts that didn't move would yeah. bind you right they were like wearing an exoskeleton but if you pull them up over your quads uh -huh. to the right height so everyone could see the glory of your quads then you also weren't <laughs> limited by the shorts now it's, it's just a habit now they also just, they also hike those shorts up to, to twerk as well Hey, you know hey, I'm, so you're I'm, not judging. You I'm not judging. I'm not judging. I'm here for the twerkers. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously you don't leave out any really important aspect of mobility in the book. And, you know, it's, it's so interesting to be able to cover so much ground in something that is so concise. You know, it's really wonderful. With that said, there's some upper body inputs as well. But even as I say that, 
when we start separating ourselves, like the upper body mm -hmm. isn't disconnected That's from right. the lower. It's, right. it's a body, yeah. you know? It's so, a system. But in particular, you really highlight something you guys call is future-proofing your neck and shoulders. What's going on with our neck and shoulders today? Well, I mean, the sitting situation is not helping our neck and shoulders. And it, you know, I, I we're, we're all here trying to sit with our best possible posture, but it's just hard to, you know, to adopt a great and functional posture when we're sitting. Um, and then I think compound the compounding factor Wait, let me, is let me jump in there because phones. everyone on the internet, is gonna, the physical therapist will be triggered around, there's no such thing as bad posture, right? So let's just say that Whatever. there are positions mm -hmm. That aren't as effective as other positions. That aren't as ideal. There's no as bad other positions. positions. No There's bad just positions. Less effective positions. That's really important because we don't want to. We don't want to scare anyone, or or do that. Right. That's not what we're trying to do here. But I, you know, I, I will say because I'm not a physical therapist, so I can say this that I think a compounding factor is our use of technology. Yeah. So we're hunched over on our phones. I mean, it would be great if we were all holding our phones in front of our faces like this, but the reality is no one's doing that. And then you add the computer element, and you know, we're all just spending a lot of our time with our shoulders forward and our neck forward on our head. And and we can we can use that session cost idea to say yeah. well. You've been here. Can you put your arms over your head? Can you yeah. express normal range of motion in another shape? Yeah. And suddenly you can see the cost of this C shape. Like one of the mobilizations we prescribe in this chapter is a T-spine mobilization where you put a ball or roller in the upper part of your back. And for me, that is one of the mobilizations that feels the best. And that also tells me that I'm spending a lot of time on my laptop with my shoulders forward. And so it's just the, the way I think about it is, okay, well, if I'm going to spend a lot of time in this forward position, then I need to spend some time in the opposite position, right? So if I'm going to be internally rotated, I need to practice externally rotating my shoulders. Um, and, you know, it, uh, it, we see, you know, when we had our in-house physical therapy clinic, we see a ton of people. We saw a ton of people with neck and shoulder problems. And, you know, in many cases, very debilitating, you know, people who had to have like cervical spine surgery and, um, and the reasons for those were complex and many, and some were injuries and some were long-term disuse and you name it. But, but I mean, it's a serious problem and really can sideline a lot of people, um, from being able to do the things they love to do. And there are some really simple tools that, you know, people can do to just sort of protect their neck and shoulders. And again, all things that could be done with their toolkit in front of their TV at night. And if you take this, no body system works by itself, right? So we've kind of hinted at before that potentially if you're missing hip range of motion, that can impact your low back. And you can imagine it's just the tail wagging the dog, yeah. right? My hips are connected to my pelvis, which is connected to my spine. And my the musculature that moves my legs is also attached to the spine sometimes. So you can you can make that psychological leap that those things are systems, the femur, the pelvis, and the lumbar. So we should be looking at the function of them all if we're going to try to improve how the whole thing works. Well, the same thing is true for your neck, your shoulder, and your upper back. That creates a really system mm -hmm. where if I'm always in a rounded position, that's going to mean that my body has to balance out that curve somewhere, and so I start to change my neck position. So if you're slouching right now, because it feels good for me to slouch, I'm just going to slouch away. But then I went ahead and turned my neck. That's as far as I can turn my head. And that's fine. And it's not about pain or no pain. I want to be clear about that. We're not talking about just pain, no pain. We're talking about how do we maintain your function? But if all of a sudden I have you just say, get into a position where you can take a big breath. So you just made a correction or an organization to your body where you improved your physiology. Why? Because in this C-shaped position, you couldn't take a big breath. I ask you to get into a position where you can take a bigger breath and you corrected internally without being cued, without doing chin tucks, without getting a shavasana. You just were like, okay. So in that position hints at greater physiology because you can ventilate more effectively. So suddenly I'm like, now look over your shoulder and all of a sudden you can turn your head around an exorcist style because you are <laughs> put yourself into a position where you have better access. And that's really what Juliet's hinting at. But because these things are so interconnected, if I have you collapse again and just feel so good, we're just hanging out here, and I say, take a big breath, you're going to take a big breath up in your neck because the way we've been sitting sort of inhibits our diaphragms, inhibits our pelvic floor, inhibits a lot of the musculature we use to just move air in and out, to ventilate. 
And so what you'll do is you'll pick up, because you're a surviving machine, you'll just start ventilating where you rest you can. And that tends to be neck. So now I'm using my neck to breathe, which isn't my primary engine. My primary engine is my diaphragm. But if I'm using my neck to breathe because I'm in a position where I can't that's access my That's the only way you can breathe. That's the only way you can breathe. Well, then that's a learned position. Plus, I spend tons of time sitting in that position. I'm only breathing in my neck. So if I'm using these little tiny neck muscles to try to yank on my spine so I can breathe, they're going to become tight because they're worked. And they're going to become tonic. And that could also be one of these complex pieces of machinery that makes me mouth breathe, that makes me... And you start to see the follow-along. And it's also stress breathing. It's right? also when you're stress breathing in this part. You know, when you're you know that if you're part, breathing through stressful. your mouth and using your neck, your cortisol is higher. Your brain thinks that's more of a threatened position. If you're being chased by a cocaine bear, I want you to breathe through your <laughs> breathe through your neck and mouth. Right? You ought to use it all. But the rest of the time, if I'm just on the answering my emails, that should not be a stressful situation. So as Juliet points out that there are positions that are more effective and they have these interesting ripples down the line that influence how I feel, the efficiency, what's going on with my brain, the messages that my brain is interacting with my body. And all we said was, hey, can you take a bigger breath in that position? Or maybe let's choose a shape that gives you better agency over your body. That's a powerful mission. Absolutely. You know, it's so fascinating that we, we have this symptom, right? And we tend to think that that's the thing. And you really highlight how if we're having neck issues, that it could be something located in your, in your back, in your shoulders. And so I was kind of pleasantly surprised to see those mobilizations focused on those other areas. And so, again, a lot of people are suffering because neck stuff can throw off everything. Oh, you know? oh Same thing with back stuff. I ended my, paddle, my professional paddling career on the U.S. canoe and kayak team with a neck injury. That was my of my own making. I just wanted everyone to know I didn't get hit. I literally created this overuse injury that injured my central nervous system in my neck and I couldn't turn my head and I was in pain and that ended my professional career. So I understand the realities of that. And when I got injured, remember injury can't do my job, I went down the rabbit hole. Physical therapy, chiro, acupuncture, give me the drugs, whatever I need to do to get this done so I can go back to my life without looking at any of the things that was contributing or causing that my body to react in that first place yeah and so again we've got mobilizations in the book but i got a question for you about strengthening the neck mm. and i'm thinking of this i'm thinking of my oldest son jordan all right so he's 22 he's got this thick strong neck matter of fact, matter of fact we got names for him i call him What's up, Nicholas or Old Saint Neck or Sick. I bet you used to watch Nickelodeon or oh, you know I'm always so messing good. with him about it. But he's got this thick, strong, beautiful neck. It just seems like he's much more resilient yes. from a possible problem, you know, just because of the sheer, you know, size of his neck. And I can't point to anything specifically that he's done, neither can he in the development of his neck, except the fact that maybe, you know, he played football. You know, so maybe he's carrying that helmet around and adding some yeah. additional yeah, you know, weight it. to it. Yeah. So I don't know. But I, obviously, there are much safer and smarter ways to make our neck stronger. Oh, put it, get, Grandma, your neck hurts. Football. <laughs> you are really hitting at something that I think is important. We know in the neck, in high performance members our background. And if we can get the neck one pound stronger, the decreases in head trauma, reactions to head trauma, like concussions, really diminish very quickly in big steps. What attaches to your neck? I don't know. Well, something that runs with shoulder. So if I can put your body into a better position, an organization where I, my neck musculature works more effectively, and it does in these shapes, I can test stronger. That tells me a lot about, hey, this is a better shape that translates to better function. But also we can look at your shoulders and these are your traps, right? So you're looking at his neck, but you're also looking at his traps. Right, yeah. And the traps are attached to the shoulder. And how do we train traps? We move our arms around. And so one <laughs> of the things that gets always missed when we're talking about pain in any part of the body is looking at range of motion. And oftentimes we don't because it hurts to do that. Like when I put my arm over my head, it hurts. Okay, let's not do that ever again. And one of the things we're trying to say is, we should be looking at restoring your range of motion as a, one of the first things that I can do in my own home safely, effectively. And remember how we did that? We just started spending time in those positions. Mm -hmm. So if I have a hard time putting my arms over my head, 
I could do downward dog or I could grab my sink or grab my wall and start to spend some time with those arms in that end range position. And what I'll see is better shoulder function, better neck function, better thoracic spine function, and the system starts to work in concert. And then you can start layering on neck strengthening, shoulder strengthening on top of it. But there's a lot we can do immediately to just start to think about putting myself into positions that allow me right. to be durable and robust. And you're so right about having a strong neck being so protective. I mean, our 14 year old daughter is a water polo goalie and it's sort of a high risk concussion environment. And, you know, her coach has her wear this weird helmet thing. And, you know, there's, there's all these concussion protocols, but we're really focused because we know on making sure she has strong shoulders and a strong neck because we're convinced that, and she's already taken some huge hits like hits we think some other kid would have already gotten a concussion and you know we, we just feel like we were trying to sort of future proof her from yeah. a concussion standpoint by making sure she has strong neck and strong shoulders yeah you know something just to share personally i had some funky stuff going on with the shoulder and and also the neck on that side but just carrying things really helped it was kind of medicine you know carrying things and doing a little bit of shrugging which i kind of shrugged off for years, you yeah. know, but it just wasn't but, functional. but getting you said the most important thing, which was getting in position, even as I'm doing the thing, where's my head placement, right? And just giving these little inputs. And it's just like, it was like, nourishing it was like medicine for those things well the other thing i'll say is you know kelly always gets worried about me like falling on the rail of the physical therapist but i mean the position that we assume all the time is the position that we're practicing and nobody thinks about it like that you know if you're just sitting here with your shoulders forward and your Practice head makes permanent baby yeah, listening. forward head on neck if you're just that you know you don't think about it that way because it's a subconscious thing you're doing while you're working on your computer or you're being on your phone but really what you're doing is practicing a position right and if you want to practice that p position that's fine but then you've got to put some input in your body to sort of undo that practice. Yeah. Rewire the practice, right? Yeah. One of my favorite sections of the book is when you're talking about the importance of walking. It's called Walk This Way. Shout out to Aerosmith. I don't know if that was on, pur on purpose. It was. Okay. Shout out. Of course. Showing our age. <laughs> and so you, you, you detailed how the amount of steps that you actually take each day is deeply connected to our lifespan. And we often don't think about this you know, because we quote work out, that that is not set aside in a sense, because we're probably going to be walking around, moving around while we're working out, but that doesn't insulate you for your body's requirement, your DNA's requirement for you to actually walk and to put these steps in. So when we opened the gym in 2005, when I went to physio school, I was like, we're going to, we're going to corner the world on walking. We're going to make walk. That, so was not, that was not, that was not what I wanted to be so, known for. It's a hard sell. But we've now, then. you know, we've now become obsessed with walking um, for a variety of reasons. I mean, you you hit on it a little bit. There are a, you know, I will go back and say that the 10,000 steps concept was invented by a Japanese pedometer company in the 60s. And 10,000 is an auspicious number in Japan. Maybe last 10,000 years. When you shout bonsai, that's 10,000 years. When you last. So you can see why that marketing worked really well because we were capturing this magical number but what's happened since then, though, is there has been a ton of research that has filled that in and shown that basically the more steps you take a day, the longer you will live and the fewer chronic illnesses you will suffer. That means I just always need to max out my steps or is there a no. minimum? Uh, you know, the minimum we say is 8,000. Um, the reason we say that is that the average American gets about 3,000 steps. And we've also read that it's actually possible for people to get up to 8,000 steps. Um, anything above 8,000 is like gold. That's great. Like if you if you have a life that allows you to be able to walk 16,000 steps a day, like more power to you, that's, that's definitely going to help your longevity. Um, but, you know, there's so many other things about walking that are so awesome. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about the lymphatic system and about how walking is the perfect way to recover from workouts. And, you know, it's the first thing that we suggest people do who come to us, who come to us with low back pain or post-surgical, because, you know, the, the best thing you can do post-surgery is just to walk and just keep everything, you know, get the garbage out of your body. But there's all these other sort of like fluffier things about walking that we like so much. I mean, we talked about this earlier everybody's talking about it online but you need to get a little bit of sunlight on your body sometimes you need to get a little 
direct sun. Um, one of the best ways to do that is to model health show says the model, <laughs> the model health show says Hello. you need to get some sun on your body. So you, you know, it has a side benefit of you get some sun on your body. It can also be really social because what we learned in the pandemic is how lonely people are, um, and how, how depressed and kids aren't doing well from a mental health standpoint. People are feeling, even though we're more and more connected online, people are feeling more and more disconnected. And so walking is the perfect way to just have simple connection with people. And so it's just this like moment. And you can be like this. What's up? I hate that guy. <laughs> but he's my neighbor. What's up? I now live in a community. And, and we're guy. fine. You know, we're fine if you treadmill walk. Like if it's, you know, if you live in Buffalo, New York, and you need to walk on a treadmill in the, in the winter, that's totally fine. Or walk but in the mall. Walk in the mall. Exactly. Right. I mean, it, you know, there's a lot of empty malls out there you can walk in. It doesn't matter. Even if it's just walking around the block. I mean, one of the things I've done is I've figured out like five places in my neighborhood that are little routes that are just leaving from my front door, walking around the neighborhood. And it's like, I know from my house to the end of the block, it's 1,750 steps. If I go from my house down this little mini loop it's 3,000 steps and so you know if if I just need to fit in some walking I've sort of set it up for myself and you know you get your hip into extension speaking of Kelly's obsession with hip hip extension it's good for the soul it's good for check, the community check this out we were working with uh, an elite military force in the army called Delta and when they have a lot of disordered sleep and they do one of the things that they started prescribing for all of their soldiers, the war fighters, was walking. walking. The, so you have all the technology in the world available to you, and the thing that's handed out is walking 12 to 15,000 steps a day. Mm. So if you're listening to this, hear this. If you have a hard time falling asleep or sleeping, one of the ways that we would help you with that is say, hey, let's see if we can get you to move more in the day, to accumulate enough non-exercise activity that you actually have sleep stress so that or it's actually called sleep pressure so that you actually want to go to sleep you actually have to move more in order to be fatigued enough and if you're been on deadlines and you're sitting and you're in board meetings you can't move and you're on zoom and you have a hard time falling asleep one of the reasons is you didn't move so as Juliet says it's one of these things that makes a huge huge difference on so many levels and for us again we're like sort of obsessed with performance and one of the things we notice when we give this this book to our athlete friends, like world champion friends, are like, wow, I don't walk enough. And when I started walking, my knees felt better. I recovered from my workouts more better. effectively. Zone two, we also found that the walking is a perfect time to do all these crazy breath drills. Mm. You can do all the eye movement tracking stuff you want. To call, you can just call checking out your neighbors, right? Where you just, your eyes track, you can look far, you can look close. Yeah. You can start doing breath holds. There's so many ways where you can turn that thing up and make it interesting. Plus, we have so many friends who are like, I'm not running. Over my dead body, I'm ever running. We're like, great. Have you met the backpack that weighs 10 pounds? Mm -hmm. And suddenly, you have a really and meaningful way to load your spine and load your tissues. It's called rucking. Welcome to walking. It is the future. Well, and I think one of the things we have done a good job of in the health and fitness business is tell people they should exercise. And Nailed they are. It. They're spending trillions of dollars on gym memberships and apps and, you know, you name it. And, and but that's not working. Like the data has out, like we, we, you know, people really didn't go to the gym that much until starting in the early 90s. Like it just, gym culture wasn't a thing. And we've all been now going to the gym and following the rule that we should exercise for X amount of time a day and X amount of time per week. And what we see is that obesity rates are rising and diabetes rates are rising. And, you know, it's not, that alone isn't working. So we, of course, are gigantic fans of exercise. Like we're exercisers, we love exercise. But what we see is that people aren't getting enough total movement in their day and it has all these unintended downstream consequences your body doesn't feel as good you can't move as freely you potentially don't sleep as well and and you know there are lots of other ways to get non-exercise activity like that could be gardening there's lots of ways to keep moving more besides just walking but what we found is that's the simple and most accessible way for people to just add in more movement in their day yeah one of the things i say is that you know can we squat with 500 pounds on our back yeah it's it's a thing we can do. Are we designed to do it per se? And you know, to do it in this kind of rep repetitive fashion, there are so many cool things that we can do. And we can get great benefit from them. The thing that we're designed to do, our genes expect us to walk. Like it's a, it's an essential movement input that I believe, and you guys know this, it activates so many beneficial things in our bodies. And I want to share a direct quote from the book. 
which I love this book, by the way. The quote is, walking puts your hips into extension, lengthens the tissues that are shortened by sitting, by the way, and puts the body back into biomechanical balance. It's, it's medicine. Walking is medicine. And you're just really like bringing it right in our faces. Like if you want to feel good, if you want to get your body in sync, get these steps and walk. It's something so nourishing about it. We're hearing a lot these days about this phenomenon called neuroplasticity. People are starting to get into the neurobiology. We, we used to think that the brain couldn't rewire itself. And now we're like, oh my gosh, the brain rewires itself and continues to grow and learn and rewire itself through your whole lifespan. That's pretty amazing. That's, that's changed in the last 20 years. One of the easiest ways to rewire your brain and create the opportunities to rewire your brain is through walking fast. So as soon as you just walk a little bit faster than a normal kind of gait, your brain starts to be like, why is this person walking fast? I should pay attention. What's going on here? So if you're trying to change some aspect, it creates this window of opportunity where you might be able to rewire pain pathways, or you might be able to remember neurons that fire together, wire together, or neurons that fire apart, wire apart. So if I'm trying to change a behavior, if I create an opportunity where my brain is more likely to do that, I'm down with that. What does that look like? Walking fast. That's pretty radical. That's a radical idea. I, I love this book called Spark by a guy named John Rady, and he says exercise and walking is like miracle grow for the brain. Yeah. And you know, if we all look forward into sort of how we want our old age to be, we want two things. We want to be able to move our body and we want to be able to use our minds. We want to stay mentally acute. You know, and so walking and exercise is just, you know, insurance. It's just an insurance policy for being able to, you know, hopefully be able to move our bodies and use our minds. So check this out. We're talking like in our 40s, we're almost 50. Take these same things we're talking about and just apply this filter to your children. What we see is that your kids all have emotion trackers, their phone, pull out their phone and look at how much they're moving. And on a rainy day, you'll be shocked to see how little they're moving. And so, you know, if, if you take any of these lessons in the book, any of these vital signs, I think you can start to say, well, if this is good for me and it's good for this world champion, how does my child do? Oh my, we just saw some data that came out very recently, like a couple days ago. Kids don't eat vegetables. They don't yeah, eat like fruits. Like 25% of kids hadn't eaten a single vegetable in the last week. That's, I think it was like 50% of vegetables, 25% of fruits. No, there was like 25, yeah. Bananas. So suddenly we're seeing sort of if we looked at walking and movement as a nutrient we're depriving our kids and we're asking them to grow then we start to ask hey you know one of my friends wrote this really cool book about sleep i don't know if you know <laughs> apply those lessons to a growing learning body yeah. and then look at how extraordinary we are in spite of all those things right, right? we're just we we really throw this this wet blanket over so much potential inadvertently because it's it's convenient or we didn't know so if we can get people to be more comfortable with these ideas of having benchmarks then you can start making different decisions about the things you're doing the day because you know like if your blood pressure is over 120 over 80 you don't freak out but you're like oh i should pay attention to that and that's what we're trying to do here right 120 over 80 is not good blood pressure it's just a it mark just where is, we know that you should yeah, start paying attention to it right you just really opened up something for me. And it's the fact that the human body is, we're, we're incredible. It's so incredible. adaptable, you know, it can be put under so much adversity and abnormal conditions and we can do all these crazy things to our bodies and still show up. We might not feel the best, but we keep trucking along. What if we stack conditions in our favor so we could feel really awesome most of the time? And also you have a toolkit in the book if problems come about which they will, they will without a doubt and you help me so much just mentally because the the body follows the mind and I was dealing with this health issue a couple of years ago and I was explaining the scenario to you and you know I got some words of encouragement some things to do but then you also before we got on the phone you was like just remember it's not a straight line right because I was every time I would get a little bit better I would look for a problem I like oh, I'm going backwards like I did this thing that's right it's not a straight line I'm still moving forward and so you've been dropping gems for years, all right? And it's filtered its way through so many other people who are making an impact on the lives of others. You two are awesome. Coming together and creating this book, it's amazing. Can you let everybody know where they can pick up the book and also just get more into your world? 
Sure. Uh, you can learn more and buy the book at builttomove.com and where I'm at Juliet Starrett on Instagram and Kelly and our company are at The Ready State on all the socials across all channels. If you're not following The Ready State, what are you doing? What are you even doing? You know, Built to Move, anywhere books are sold, but specifically hit the website is... builttomove.com. Builttomove.com. Or anywhere you buy a book. And literally, one of the things I just want to say is that you are listening to this show... You are so far ahead of so many people who don't have it. It's true. Like the, I have really ninja, sophisticated friends listen to this show, and we want you to find your blind spots because we know you're doing it. And so, can we pick up some spots where we're like, oh, I can improve on that? And simultaneously, we wanted to create a resource where you could reach to your neighbor or to an auntie or an uncle who feel don't identify with diet culture, don't identify with exercising but w really want to take their health and life over, this is one of those places where you can start because it's so accessible. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here. Like, why would muscle mass be so integral to longevity? I know old people who are skinny and they've, you know, they've lived a long time and they don't, don't appear to have much muscle mass. Well, muscle mass combined with strength and power is what causes the rest of the organs in the body to have a reason to keep up with the muscles.